Hey everybody, welcome to Crackpot, the podcast region every week. We dive into a different conspiracy theory and we also discuss the merits or the demerits of each. We're your hosts, I'm Tim. And I'm Zach. And I'm Tim. Welcome back, my dude. Thank you. Well, we're here. <laughs> this one, folks, also practically live at time of recording. It's true. It's uh, 4.59 a.m. and it's dropping at 5. <laughs> we got quick, an hour <laughs> to record it. Don't make any mistakes. We can't edit this. That's right. That's right. No, so I tell you what, Tim and I, you know, we just got it through our haunted month of October, bringing you nothing but basically haunted spooky stories. We thought, hey, you know what? Got to pivot here a bit. Yeah. Got to jump back into our old bread and butter. That's right. Talk some UFO UAP stuff. Woo! And uh, this is a grab bag. I got the first half. Timmy Boy here's got the second half. Yep. We thought, let's talk about a few things in the UFO UAP community that have that have surfaced, not just recently, but uh, have been rattling around You know, the crackpot uh, idea desk for quite some time. There we go. Yeah. So first half of the show, folks, I am talking about the Majestic 12. MJ-12. Yes, sir. Nice. Second half of the show, what you got? Immaculate Constellation. That sounds really fancy. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> if if you've been a part of the uh, UFO Twitter or UFO universe, you've probably seen this pop up. But there's a new whistleblower saying new things uh, about our government's alleged UFO capabilities and programs. So we'll dive into that. <laughs> we'll dive into that. So, yeah, first one here we're going to talk about... Uh, UFO committee, if you will, okay. that was set up to look into the uh, UFO phenomena. Can I just say, before you even dive into it, yeah. MJ-12 has literally been on the list since day one. It, it's been <laughs> top top of the list, the original list, for a long time. And I've come across it dozens of times in different readings and looking up different topics and all sorts of stuff. And I just can't make heads or tails of it. Because there are some that say it is just 100% all true. Mm -hmm. All of it. Mm -hmm. Verbatim. Yep. And then there are other legitimate people who say the whole thing is a hoax and made up and it's nothing but uh, just lies and uh, deceit. Yeah. That's what made this really hard. And I actually had a really hard time uh, Well, with two things. Number one, there's not that much on it. Open source. Right. So if you go out there, I mean, you'll find a Wikipedia page, but there's not much to it. I was kind of saved by you. You brought over like four or five books and were like, hey, there's references to this and all these books. Can you take a look? <laughs> yeah. Luckily, you did. And luckily, I did too. And then also some open source research. And I, I found some other stuff too. It was like, I had to stitch it all together because I was like, why does this even really matter? Yeah. Good I, point. I, yeah. I was like, who cares? Like, we know that there have been committees formed to study this stuff, like Project Blue Book, for instance, right? Like, mm-hmm. this, this should be nothing new. And if it's, in fact, a real committee, well, that just tells us. It's another committee that looked into this stuff. <laughs> so I'll, I'll try to make sense of this later. I'll tell you why I think it's important. Uh, but you hit the nail on the head, basically. Uh, this has been a very controversial topic for decades at this point now. And because you have probably 50% of the folks that have looked into this say it's a hoax, other 50% say, no, it's absolutely real. Yep. So what is it, Zach? What is MJ-12? Well, I can give you a very simple answer to that. And MJ-12 is a purported secret committee of scientists, military leaders, and government officials formed, allegedly, in 1947 by executive order by U.S. President at the time, Harry S. Truman, to facilitate recovery and investigation of alien spacecraft. Let's just stop right there. That's a big claim. That's a big claim, right? (laughs) The president in 1947, was it? Correct. Uh, Got together a group of scientists and other people that said, uh, let's look at all these spacecraft that are visiting us and figure it all out. Exactly right. Now, here's what I'll say. MJ-12 was, I don't want to say like a one and done thing. But already by like the 70s, it was more or less disbanded, Okay. according to what I was able to, to ascertain here. Um, however, it kind of rose to prominence in the conspiracy theory in the mid-80s. And we'll get into why that was. Interesting. So I think, you know, when we're talking about something like this, super important to consider the time and the place, right? 1947. What just happened in the world? 
in 1947. Um, I, think, I think the Yankees won the World <laughs> Series. What Probably. else was going on? Oh, yeah, the World War, the Second World War. Huh? That's right. Just had wrapped up. And, you know, as I think we've talked about on the show quite a few times, there was a lot of confusion as to what some of the pilots were seeing in the sky. The Foo Fighters. That's Foo exactly Fighters, that's right. right. Yeah. And if you're not familiar, just balls of light following airplanes and pilots around uh, combat scenarios. Both sides, too. Not just U.S. pilots, but Japanese and German pilots as well. Exactly right. So war finishes up. You know, both sides, all sides of the war had seen, I guess you'd say, like, unexplainable things in the sky. And so... As a result of that, and by the way, Kenneth Arnold UFO sighting in Washington right. are said to be the impetus for this uh, committee and the need to look into this stuff. So returning back to like one of the questions that I had like brought up earlier, which is like, what is the significance of MJ-12? Because yeah, we already know Operation Paperclip, Project Blue Book, all that stuff. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that if this committee really existed... And if the documents that are alleging this committee to be true and real, well, said documents also have documented uh, mentioning of the crash at Roswell. Okay. So the significance here really is the documents that were found and the documents that reference both MJ-12 as a committee with the purpose of looking into the Roswell crash, the alien bodies that were recovered, the craft that was recovered, as well as attempts to help kind of cover up or discredit anyone who says aliens are real. So this presupposes that Roswell was a true UFO crash. This, in fact, states that Roswell was a true UFO crash. And then MJ-12 basically came out because of Roswell and a number of other things. Exactly. Fascinating. So let's talk about this. So we had uh, July 8th, 1947. The infamous now Roswell incident occurs, right? A rancher discovers wreckage near Roswell, New Mexico. U.S. Army initially states, hey, look, it's a uh, flying disc, but then walks it back and says later it's a weather balloon, which, Mm -hmm. of course, Mm -hmm. ignited all sorts of uh, speculation. After the alleged disc was recovered, the wreckage was moved to Wright Field. This is uh, in Ohio. President Truman, of course, realized that he would need some panel of experts to study the wreckage and the phenomena. And then if you believe the theory, well, according to MJ-12 as a conspiracy theory, there was a memo that was signed by President Truman on September 24th, 1947, where he explicitly authorizes the creation of the Majestic 12. <laughs> and uh, according to this document, the purpose of MJ-12 is to detail the recovery and concealment of alien technology. Fascinating. And so as I said earlier, you know, quite a few experts, right, military intelligence experts. Uh, I'll list off the names. I suspect they probably won't mean a ton to you, but you'll note that most of them are either doctors or uh, at some level of, like, intelligence um, rank. So we have an Admiral Roscoe H. Hillenketter, Dr. Vannevar Bue, Secretary James V. Porisdale, General Nathan P. Twining, General Hoyt S. Vandenberg, Dr. Detlev Bronk, Dr. Jerome Hunsacker, Mr. Sidney W. Suri, Mr. Gordon Gray, Dr. Donald Menzel, General Robert M. Montague, and Dr. Lloyd V. Berkner. Okay. Those names are all listed specifically in this memo that he... Harry Truman signed. And you can find pictures or facsimiles, copies of this memo, right? You can. You Alle- can. Allegedly, <laughs> it's real. Exactly. So you can go out there and Google this. You can find it. All those names are listed on there. Um, and I'll mention this because I think it's important. So in addition to studying the UFO, UAP, alien phenomena, the group's reported objective was to keep the existence of extraterrestrial life a secret from the public to study alien technology or biological samples that could have national security implications. So the idea was they're looking at the UFO phenomenon as basically some sort of national security concern, if you will. Sure. Well, obviously, you know, in here in the United States, we don't have kings or queens. We have uh, presidents that are elected, in theory. In theory. So, of course, Truman knew his time would come to an end as president. Who came next? Well, President Eisenhower... 
Hmm. And, uh, well, Truman had to brief Eisenhower on MJ-12 and its implications. So, okay. Truman sits down, types up a memo to Eisenhower, says, hey, we've got this MJ-12 thing. We recovered this craft at Roswell. We recovered four bodies with that. Here are the committee members. And then he sends it off to Eisenhower to continue his work as president. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's it. That's it. That's Majestic 12. End of story. End of story. Except (laughs) Uh when you get into the conspiracy theory angle here. (laughs) Well, let's just stop right there. I mean, okay. If if you take it all to be true, like it makes sense. If if a UFO crashed with bodies on it, it would make sense that the president would want a committee and he would want smart people to be thinking about what to do and how to handle it and where to go. That all checks out. Um, if you go back and listen to the Roswell episode we did, I got a little bit of a flack for it because I don't necessarily believe that it was UFO craft that landed, but that's beside the point. We're just going with it for now. Um, what are your thoughts? I mean, does anything stick out at this point as just being a completely out of left field, red herring, this is fake? No, and that's why to me, and again, before I get into the whole conspiracy theory side of this thing, the whole story there, like what I'll tell you is, to me, I thought, yeah, this would just make logical sense. Mm-hmm. You have a legit national security threat. There's an impetus here to look into this stuff. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, well, therefore, why wouldn't we have something called the Majestic 12? Sure, sure. But I want to ask you this because we haven't talked about this since we did the Roswell show. So you read Lou Elizondo's book, right? Yep. Because I think, and I only listened to the audiobook version, but if I'm not mistaken, like he legit said there was a... Yep. He, he believes there was a crash, yeah. UFO so, crash. Yeah. So, you know, in the time since you did the show and then read that book, did your mind change at all on that I point? mean, I'm more open to it. Here's, I mean, without going into this too far, I, I was on the fence. I felt like I just had to pick a side. And yeah. there was enough out there that just made me question it. And I'm like, eh, no, I don't believe it. You know, I mean, I'm not s- stuck I'm nothing set in stone. Like I could be persuaded that it was in fact, some sort of ET craft or something like that, I guess. So yeah, I'm not going to close the door on it. So you're pretty much, uh, it sounds like 60, 40, something like that. Yeah. Okay. 60, 40, not in on it. 40% in on it. Yeah. Okay. Well, interesting. I don't know. I honestly don't know where I stand on this mm-hmm. anymore. I kind of didn't believe it, but then like hearing Lou talk about it and also like, yeah, the government did say, I think initially, like they recovered some oh, sort yeah, of Oh, yeah, yeah. No, initially they said it was a disc. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, the problem is there's just too much information on Roswell that it's yeah. impossible to just sort out what's real and what's not at this point. So, I, yeah, that's where I stand. There you go. Well, let's come back to MJ-12 here because um, the story continues on. So we've had, you know, like, let's just say, hey, like any other normal governmental, you know, defense agency type situation come up. Yeah, there's, you know, a committee that's formed and the public generally doesn't really know about it. And it would just disappear. And that's that, Mm -hmm. right? Yep. Well, except that in December 1984, a package with no return address and then Albuquerque postmark arrived in ufologist Jamie Shandera's mail in North Hollywood, California. Okay. So there's this package that shows up. It's got no return address, and there's really no no context added to it, right? Interesting, though, it's from Albuquerque. Yes. Not far from Roswell. Uh Uh-huh. Anyway, so inside of this package was uh, an undeveloped roll of 35-millimeter film. What does uh, Shandera do? Of course, he goes and develops it. When he developed it, he found pictures that were basically like, you know, DIY photocopies, if you will, right, of documents which were eight pages of an alleged briefing dated November 18th, 1952, in which Vice Admiral Roscoe Hillenketter, he was one of the people on MJ-12, told President-elect Dwight Eisenhower of the recovery of the remains of two crashed spaceships. In addition to the acknowledgement of a UFO crash, it also references the creation of the committee, the Majestic 12. Okay. 
So again, this Majestic 12 committee, if it's real, it existed for a couple of decades and then kind of went away. And then suddenly this UFOlogist, you know, receives this package and there's these pictures of these documents that say it's a real thing. They recovered craft and uh, they're looking into it. So the pictures of the documents that he opened, that this uh, UFOlogist opened, um, those are different than the original MJ-12 documents? Uh, yeah. So the original MJ-12 documents... What's confusing about this whole story is there's only references to the Majestic 12 oh, okay. in these documents. Okay. You don't find like the literal like creation of the committee. It's like, hey, here's what it is. Here's what it does. And it's a reference to all of that. So let me, let me read a few excerpts from the meta memo here. So it says, Operation Majestic 12 is a top secret research and development intelligence operation responsible directly and only to the president of the United States. Operation of the project are carried out under control of the Majestic 12 group, which was established by special classified executive order of President Truman on the 24th of September, 1947. Now, the document does go on to acknowledge the UFO sightings that were reported during World War II. It also talks about the Kenneth Arnold incident. Mm -hmm. Not much else. <laughs> but here's what else it says, and this is why it's important. So it said on July 7th, 1947, a secret operation was begun to assure recovery of the wreckage of this object for scientific study. During the course of this operation, aerial reconnaissance discovered that four small human-like beings had apparently ejected from the craft at some point before it exploded, right? So this is Roswell. These had fallen to earth about two miles east of the wreckage site. All four were dead and badly decomposed due to actions by predators and exposure to the elements. Hmm. Uh, they talk also, I won't keep reading this, but it talks about how they moved the, the craft to a different site. And then, uh, I'll, I'll continue reading on here. Um, a covert analytical effort organized by General Twining and Dr. Bush acting on the direct orders of the president resulted in a preliminary consensus that the disc was most likely a short range reconnaissance craft. This conclusion was based for the most part on the craft size and the apparent lack of identifiable provisioning. A similar analysis of the four dead occupants was arranged by Dr. Bronk. It was the tentative conclusion of this group that although these creatures are human-like in appearance, the biological and evolutionary processes responsible for the development have apparently been quite different from those observed in Homo sapiens. <laughs> so you have in this document that was developed by the ufologist, A, reference to the MJ-12, and B, mm, References to, hey, look, we found craft and we found aliens. Weird. So, I mean, that is the big deal. Uh, what happens next? Yeah. So, Shindera's like, well, I got to find something else here to corroborate this evidence. It's not enough just to get some, I don't know, mysterious package in the mail. Uh, well, apparently Shandera received a tip from someone who worked or claim to work in the Air Force intelligence community, suggesting they search the National Archives. Uh, Shandera and his associate, William Moore, he was co-author of the Roswell incident, so another ufologist, mm -hmm. flew to D.C. They searched the National Archives looking for references in official documents to MJ-12. What'd they find? Nothing. They found a July 1954 memo from General Robert Cutler, who was an Eisenhower assistant, referring to an MJ-12 SSP to be held at the White House on the 16th of that month. Huh. What's SSP? According to them, Special Studies Project. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So it was referenced in a legit Memo. document in the National Archives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, of course, does that mean they're both talking about the same thing. Eh, maybe, I don't know, but, uh, I, I never heard that. That's weird. It's super interesting, isn't it? <laughs> so you have, what's kind of confusing about this is like, yep, yeah, there's a committee that makes sense. You know, it was basically classified for decades in the eighties. A journalist gets this under undeveloped role of film. It happens to be references to all this craft and the MJ 12. And then they can corroborate it based on a memo in the National Archives. Now, it does say, I mean, if you're going to play the devil's advocate, it does say MJ-12 SSP. Yes. Doesn't say the Majestic 12. Right. Whose purpose is to study aliens, <laughs> right. right? Right. So you kind of have to take that leap of faith. Right. But there is potentially corroborating evidence. I've never heard that it was actually referenced outside the UFO 
universe. That was it, though. That was the only reference to it. That's so interesting. So okay. It is interesting. And that's also... So after this happens, then, at the same time, there's a British journalist by the name of uh, Timothy Good. He receives that similar role of film, looks into this stuff. And pretty soon you have international news here in the mid-'80s blowing up talking about this Majestic 12. Fascinating. So this kind of took off, actually, in the 80s. And, of course, government denies everything. Yeah. And then, of course, you yeah. would say, well... They're going to start to discredit the folks that looked into this stuff. Probably, yeah. Cause cause quite a stir, of course. So, again, it doesn't say in that memo <laughs> in the National Archives, you know, specifically yeah. what MJ-12 12 is. is about UFOs and aliens. <laughs> but, of course, you have people that come down on both sides of this. Yeah. So you have, I think, one of the more famous UFO debunkers, Philip Class. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, he's he's a big one out there. Yeah. He claimed it's all a hoax. Yep. Uh, and there are reasons why he might be right, maybe. So according to Class, he said the style and the dating system, uh, which was, by the way, adding a zero in front of like one of the single dates in the month, proved that this document was a hoax. So what he was saying was the documents that we're looking at here that the, that the journalists have – they're fake. You can tell because they don't follow the typical, you know, dating system. Exactly. And it, you know, even appears to maybe be doctored according exactly. to, to yep. Mr. Class. Well, the FBI looked into it and they can't figure out who might have forged this document. Oh, the FBI got involved? Yeah. <laughs> okay. This is making the headlines, baby. FBI is going to get involved. Oh, I have no idea. Right. But then on the other side of the whole debate, you have this researcher, Stan Friedman, of course, he had looked at other documents from the time frame that were written by this same Admiral Helen Ketter. Yeah, he said they matched the MJ-12 briefing. Style suggests it's authentic. Oh, and I, I will mention this much too. So, like I said, you know, previously I couldn't find much on the internet. You'd give me a few books. I found in one of the books that you'd give me, they said that in 1980 uh, there was a document that also referenced MJ-12 as like literally MJ-12. Mm -hmm. Dude, I couldn't, there was no, there was nothing in the appendix. I yeah. couldn't find anything online. It was just like, you know, going down the rabbit hole. Yep. Couldn't produce anything there. So, uh, okay. So if MJ-12 is real, it means that the government acknowledged that there was a crashed UFO with bodies at Roswell, and they were looking into it. And That's were, exactly right. And they were trying to cover it up. Exactly right. And they've been lying about it for 80 years. 100% right. And if it's not true, <laughs> it's just a bunch of ufologists, <laughs> you know. Trying just to sell a, some books or something. Yeah, right, yeah. exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. And I mean, to your point, like, you know, s seeing something referenced and not being able to find the follow-up, I mean, that is exactly the the dead ends I kept running into when I was, you know, just half attempting to think about doing this topic it's so frustrating and i mean i don't even know if you got into like the whole typeset like what typewriter was this written on and oh it was done on this typewriter which wasn't actually made until 1953 in august oh but maybe it was this older model that had this other it's like oh my god <laughs> you get to a point and you're like I, like what do i even do with all this information no, you can't make heads or tails of it. So that is the, uh, I mean, that is the storyline. That's what's alleged to have happened, if you believe it. Now, there is one other angle that we can go down. There's also a theory that these MJ-12 docs were a hoax created by the government. Yes. To create, you know, a stir, if you will. Which is my favorite. It's my favorite <laughs> because it's always, it's always, you know, it's the ace up the sleeve. It's like, no, they're real, but they were designed to be fake to discredit people, but they were, <laughs> you know discrediting them as they're trying to push them as well. And it's it's like 40 chess going on here. And at that point, you just kind of have to throw up your hands and be like, well, <laughs> I don't know. I'll never know. Exactly. So, yeah, we don't know if these documents are real. They sound like they might be. Wouldn't be a huge surprise if we had a committee looking into this stuff. But also, okay, if these documents are real, then I guess <laughs> we do have craft and alien bodies. Sure. I mean, why not? But I mean, to me... The most interesting thing of this is that MJ-12 is referenced in a quote-unquote legitimate government document. Yes. So either they're talking about the same thing or they're talking about something completely different without going to the archives and looking into it. I can't say, but it's fascinating. Very fascinating. Huh. Where do you come down? Well, okay. It's a little convenient that a ufologist, you know, got this information 
you know, the pictures of the documents. Like, you know, that, that to me is a little weird um, because, yeah, if it was sent to like a random member of the public, it might seem a little bit more credible just in the sense that like, you know, a ufologist is going to want to promote his sure. or her own work. Right? Well, send so. it to the New York Times. Send right. it to the, you know, whatever. Actually, that's a good point. Yeah, send it to like a quote, well, I send quote, it to legit. S- yeah, well, I send it to some rando in North Hollywood. Like, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Come on, seriously. So to me, that's like strike against it. Mm-hmm. However, I believe I believe there was a committee, whether it was called the Majestic 12 or something else. I mean, I'm sure after Roswell, you know, that took place. Sure. What it alleges... Well, I kind of believe anyways, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm all in, baby. Yeah, I'm not too far behind. Yeah. All right. Well, let's switch gears slightly and talk about something a bit more current. We are talking about Immaculate Constellation. And you're saying, what the heck is that? Why is that name so amazing? Zach, what do you feel about that name? I think it's an incredible name. Do you? Yeah. That's because great. Yeah. It's an Immaculate Constellation. <laughs> It's just all sorts of stuff put together. So this is a new government program that was apparently just kind of uh, released or or made known by a whistleblower. Uh, so let's kind of take a step back here. We we know more about the author of this than we do about the whistleblower because the the journalist, the author of this article that came out, uh, is taking uh, the whistleblower's privacy incredibly seriously because this is putting their life in danger, putting their career, their family, everything else. So we don't know what branch of the military, if military, we don't know the age, the name, of course, we don't even know the gender of this person. However, as we'll get into, their story has been verified by, I believe, 60 different people. Whoa. So, okay. It appears to have legs, but let's talk about the author, Michael Schellenberger. He's a journalist. He covers government corruption and whistleblower cases. (laughs) So he's done uh, legitimate articles on the FBI, the CIA, uh, Department of Homeland Security. He's legit. He's legit. You can go out there and look up his articles, not about UFOs, to just kind of see that this guy is uh, who he says he is. And not too long ago, he published an article about an unnamed whistleblower having to do with the United States UAP program. And as I said, he has been able to verify the various facts and statements in this whistleblower statement by 60 unnamed sources, none of whom knew each other. Mm. So that's something, too. No kidding. It wasn't like, oh, yeah, call my buddy Bob. He can tell you it's all true. It's like, no, he went around and talked to people who didn't necessarily know all the players and was able to get periphery information and corroborate it, so on and so forth. But um, those sources are government employees and government contractors, and they all had either first or secondhand accounts of this UAP program. But let's take a step back. We were talking about presidents Eisenhower and Truman not too long ago here. We know in recent times, presidents have been talking about UFOs and UAPs as well. President Trump has stated that he's been briefed about F-22 pilots that have had interactions with orbs that they can't explain. President Obama has said that he, uh, or that we have footage and records of objects in the sky that we can't explain their propulsion. So former presidents on the record talking about weird stuff in the sky. So anyway, just want to bring you all back if you're not 100% in on the UAP thing yet. But the whistleblower, like I said, completely anonymous. They were not looking for this information. In fact, the whistleblower says that they don't really have any sort of uh, fascination with the topic. They okay. they just they completely stumbled upon this okay. out of left field. They were not looking for it. They were not trying to do it. They don't think about UFOs in their off time. They probably are not listeners to our show, unfortunately, yet. But let's talk about what they actually say. This whistleblower says that the U.S. government has a highly classified program that is dedicated to the recovery and reverse engineering of UAP. Mm. Now, we've heard these claims before. Grush, David Grush, uh, another whistleblower, has talked about this, but just kind of, he's just kind of thrown it out there. He's just been like, hey, yeah, we recover craft and we try to reverse engineer them. And there really hasn't been much more to it. And some people right. believe them, some people don't. And that's fine. What makes this different 
is that we now have a name that goes with it. And I know what you're thinking. You can name something, anything, and what difference does a name make? (laughs) A name makes all the difference in the world when you're trying to do a FOIA request. So FOIA is, of course, the Freedom of Information Act. You, as a citizen of the United States, can write to any level of government that you want and ask to see public records, anything created by the government that's not protected. But in order to do this well, especially with the Department of Defense or the CIA or these big three-letter organizations, you need to ask them specifically what you're looking for. Oh, You can't just say, give me all the documents you have since 1947 on crash retrieval. Sure. They'll be like, no. We're not going to. Huh. We need a name. We need some dates. Which I guess makes sense because you can't just, you know, throw a line out of the water and net and expect whatever yeah, to come yeah, back. So exactly. Okay. Exactly. That's reasonable. So, like I said, in 2023, David Grush, who was a former Air Force officer and intelligence specialist with the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency and National Reconnaissance Office, he told us that the U.S. government has recovered several vehicles quote, of exotic origin attributed to non-human intelligence, whether extraterrestrial or otherwise unknown, based on the unique vehicle morphologies, material science analyses, and distinctive atomic arrangements and radiological signatures. He also reiterated these claims under oath in front of a congressional subcommittee. Wow. So it's a big claim. That's a huge claim. It's a pretty <laughs> bold claim. So this information that we have now with this new whistleblower isn't exactly new, like I said, but it is fascinating nonetheless. The whistleblower goes a step further and says that this highly secretive Pentagon program investigates, recovers, and attempts to reverse engineer alien technologies. Now... The Department of Defense has, of course, been asked about this. You know what they said? (laughs) No dice. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Spokesperson Stephanie Goh denied the program exists. She said the Department of Defense has no record, present or historical, of any type of SAP called Immaculate Constellation. Okay. Where does that bring us? Well... Actually, before we talk about where that brings us, let's talk about a little bit more in detail what this whistleblower told Michael Schellenberger in his article. Because there's some interesting stuff besides just a big name and, uh, you know, recovering and reverse engineering craft. This whistleblower talks about an encounter with an F-22. And this might actually be the same one that President Trump talked about. Okay. I don't know. Maybe Mm -hmm. it happens all the time. But an encounter with an F-22 where a group of Three to six orbs surrounded the plane and then forced it out of its designated patrol area. So the orbs stayed on the jet or or next to the jet in a fixed geospatial place. Like basically, you know, put it on a pin board and it just didn't move. Whether the plane was diving or rolling or accelerating, it was just fixed on the craft and they kept kind of inching them further and further off of the trajectory of where they were supposed to go Uh, just i well i don't know i mean what (laughs) what do you what are your thoughts on that well i believe it uh that would be terrifying if you're like the uh, pilot of that craft yeah i mean it doesn't sound like they are um friendly Yeah, yeah you know what i mean well you could also say maybe they're curious could be curious yeah but oh, they also have control over our, you know, highest, most like technical military. Right. Them. I mean, are they hostile or not? I mean, they're not bringing the craft down, but they're not necessarily. I mean, they're interfering with the mission. Right. You know, it's like, what? What are their motives? It's so bizarre. And also, it just sounds exactly like these Foo Fighters <laughs> that pilots have been seeing for like 80 years. OK, well, that's interesting. The whistleblower talked about another case. There was a crew on an aircraft carrier out in the ocean, and they saw an orange-red orb descend from an incredibly high altitude and drop suddenly, we're talking like within a second or two, to about 100 yards above the flight deck, and then just stopped and stayed there. And it was bright, but it didn't illuminate anything around it. It was just a bright light Mm. that didn't... (laughs) 
<laughs> give off any, I don't know. But they said the surface of the orb looked like like a close-up of the sun that you see in some of these telescopes, just roiling and bubbling oh, and no boiling. And the crew who witnessed it, several hundred people on the deck of the ship, saw it. And they all said to a person that they had an incredibly uneasy feeling while it was there. But then once it zipped away back up into the sky, everyone felt like they woke up out of a trance. Oh, weird. Wow. Mm. (laughs) I Mm -hmm. don't know. Okay. Well, that's all cool stuff. But this one to me is the kicker. This third one here. There is apparently an enormous database with every UFO that has ever been cataloged, seen, documented, all the craft, all the species we've interacted with, everything. The holy grail of ufologists. They say that this database exists. It is a government database disconnected from the internet, completely separate from all other computer systems. It has high-resolution photos, high-resolution videos, none of this grainy crap that we have to see on YouTube or anything, infrared videos, documentation of encounters, and measurement and signature intelligence. So it also has firsthand accounts of people that witness this stuff or people who have been abducted. And also, a lot of this information comes from low-orbit satellites at military and civilian aviation altitudes and maritime environments. Dang. So, basically, our low-orbit satellites are tracking everything that's coming in and out of our atmosphere Uh on high-resolution video. Uh And also, the maritime environments. We're talking about UFOs going underwater, guys. They are transmedium craft. They can go between the air and the water without any sort of physics involved, I guess. I don't know. (laughs) USOs. Right. Unidentified submerged objects. Well, so this so this would yeah, be like the like you said, the Holy Grail. This is like a complete database of everything ever. And it's interesting you mentioned the uh, satellites too, because I always thought like, look, we've got people Walking on the moon, we got satellites in orbit. Certainly, they would see something. Yeah, you would think so. Yeah. Apparently, they are. That's awesome. And, of course, uh, he mentions, or they mention, uh, this has uh, detailed descriptions of UFOs, orbs, triangles, saucers, Tic Tacs, boomerangs, you name it. They got it all in this database, which is wild. Also talks about uh, how the U.S. government has the capability to detect, quarantine, and transfer UAP and, quote, alien reproduction vehicle collection incidents Hmm. before they are observed and circulated within the military. So basically like a um, advance crew that's able to get to nearly anywhere a craft goes down before... Even the military is made aware of it. <laughs> this gets me thinking back to like, we did what? A uh, Kecksburg UFO yeah. incident. And there was like this crew that just showed they up. They just and showed up. Cleaned up the wreckage. The men in black. Huh. Yeah, right? <laughs> I, yeah. Kind of, okay. right? There we go. So this alien reproduction vehicle. So this is apparently a reference to a vehicle that was constructed from non-human technology constructed by either the U.S. government or government contractors. Mm -hmm. So this is the reverse engineering using alien technology. And allegedly, apparently, we have done it, China has done it, and Russia has done it. These are the three countries that are actively involved in this uh, reverse engineering craft retrieval process. Dang. And let me just kind of take a moment here to just kind of pause and say, I realize how crazy this all sounds. (laughs) That being said, this whistleblower is uh, a you know according to the author of this article who is a legit journalist is up and down telling the truth verified by numerous sources willing to go in front of congress if they have to to testify under oath that all this is true it's kind of wild 
The report, I should mention, also talks about the United States using kinetic military actions to take down craft. Oh, wait, wait, wait. So, like, basically shooting them down? Yeah. Ugh. So, this is lethal force. As opposed to, so there's kinetic military actions and then there's soft military actions. Okay. Soft military is like diplomacy, tariffs, you know, embargoes. <laughs> kinetic is like... A cruise missile. <laughs> so uh, apparently we're also shooting them down out of the sky. So mm, USA one aliens zero. Allegedly. Mm. But yeah, I guess we've uh, successfully reverse engineered a triangular craft with non-traditional propulsion. And um, of course, it talks about the active and ongoing government disinformation campaigns to make people like uh, Zach and I sound like crazy lunatics every time we talk about this, Ugh. which uh, maybe jury's out. <laughs> and this one, which I don't know why I say for last, should probably be first contact and collaboration with non human entities. Dang. Yeah. Mic okay. drop. Yeah. No kidding. Like, what is that about? <laughs> that is. Uh... Peculiar. So, Crackpot listeners, if you're out there and you have access to a database, <laughs> I mean, you know. If you're listening to this at work and your job is to comb through that database, like you're an analyst on whatever <laughs> team that is, tell give, us. Give us a call. Yeah. Call the just, listener line. Just let us know. Send us a voice memo. <laughs> I, I'm, just, I'm just curious. Okay, so why is this a big deal? Why do we care? Why is there a whistleblower? Why are we talking about it? Because, Zach, it's illegal. Ooh. Yeah. Article 1 of the Constitution requires congressional oversight of all activities of the executive branch. Okay, okay, okay. These activities and these actions would be under the executive branch of the government. Therefore, they would need to tell Congress what they are doing and... So on and so forth. And I know what you're saying. Tim, we have to have secrets. Mm. We can't just be telling Congress where all of our spies are in different countries and where our subs are in the bottom of the ocean. Yes, that is true. However, they still have to at least mention it because there's two different categories here. There's the unacknowledged special access program. Mm -hmm. That sort of information you can give to a, a committee. Uh, in a skiff. I don't know if you're familiar with what a skiff is. It's yep. literally like a, a trailer sized uh, room and it's uh, completely devoid of any sort of listening technology. And you're, you know, it's a Faraday box. Basically, you can't, there's like no electronic signals coming in or going out. Basically. Exactly. You go in, you're briefed, you're not allowed to write anything, you're not allowed to record anything, you come out, you're sworn to secrecy. So, there's also the waived unacknowledged special access program. These are only given to the Gang of Eight. So the Gang of Eight is this uh, select group of Congress. It's the leaders of the two parties of the Senate and the House of Representatives and the chairs of the ranking majority and minority members on the Senate Committee and the House Committee for Intelligence. So there's eight of these people. There's Turner, Hines, Warner, Rubio, Johnson, Jeffries, Schumer, and McConnell at time of recording. That might change. I don't know. We'll see. But anyway... The point is, those people would still need to be briefed, if not on the details, just that this exists in a broader sense. Mm. How do we know this didn't happen? Because Marco Rubio was on the committee that asked David Grush some questions earlier and said, hey, is there a program that does X, Y, Z? And the Department of Defense spokesperson who I mentioned earlier, Sue Gao, said no. No such thing exists. Mm. If she has knowledge of it, which she would, given her rank and title and everything else, at least supposedly, and she denied its existence in front of Congress, you could be punished by imprisonment, essentially, for lying to Congress. So it's important in the sense that we still have a functioning Constitution <laughs> and we still have checks and balances and... Congress at least needs to have a, an awareness of what's going on, but they've been keeping the secret, which is a direct violation of the first article of the Constitution. Well, and furthermore, I mean, we have an entire database of uh, crafts. <laughs> furthermore, how can you hide this stuff from us? Seriously. It's so damn cool. Huh. Man, that is how sick. How dare you? I, dude, I believe this one 100%. <laughs> 
I kind of do too. I mean, there's a lot of far fetched things that this whistleblower says. I'll be the first to admit. Okay. But um, I keep coming back to this uh, this journalist. He's he's incredibly credible. Um, and I come back to the David Grush stuff. Like a lot of the stuff that he said came out later is true. Like we get these whistleblowers. They talk about the UFO stuff. It seems crazy. We kind of forget about it. And then like three or five or 10 years later, we're like, oh yeah, actually that was true. <laughs> so true. it's like, oh shoot. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so part of me is like, yeah, um, this could very well be real. Dang. The other part of me is like, yeah, I don't know. It, well, I, I am curious. Uh, was or do you remember any of the like oddball claims that the whistleblower came up with? Was there anything that just like to you was like, eh, is this really for real? No, I mean, it's you know, I, oddball claim is like a uni- United States government being in contact with alien species, <laughs> you know, to <laughs> okay. just work stuff out and talk back and forth. I mean, that is crazy. Like, I I, I okay. can't sit here with a straight face and say it's not, but given what we know is happening and given just the various things people have seen and, and everything else, maybe. Dang. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> so anyway, Immaculate Constellation, that's why you've seen it in the news. That's what it means. Stay tuned. We will do definitely be hearing more about this in the coming weeks and months and years i'm certain of it love it all right guys well hey thank you for tuning into this week's uh crackpot ufo grab bag roundup extraordinaire um if you haven't already hey rate review subscribe tell your friends tell your neighbors tell your local whistleblower about our podcast we'll see you next week thanks everybody